audience i am akanksha from isf sham and today i am going to introduce to a person whom you are going to find uh, incredibly inspirational a professor a lawyer an explorer and rest of the things he himself is going to tell about him my name's um associate professor paul harper and i'm i'm totally blind i was hit by a train at the age of 14 um since then i've um done a fair few things i was a paralympian at one point i've become a lawyer i've been a company director and now i chair the university of queensland disability inclusion group and i'm also a future fellow which is a four year funded project from the commonwealth government trying to increase employability for people with disabilities back in the past and so can you tell us uh, share about your experiences before the accident this happened how was your journey then about your journey? sure background yeah sure well when i was a um a young man i oh, was sorry boy I, i had no disability so i grew up to the age of 14 with no disability um i was fortunate enough at the age of 7 to go up to papua new guinea on a church mission with my pa- my family and there was uh, i met a blind man called tony randall and that became really important to me when i later lost my own eyesight in an accident um because tony had lost his eyesight when he was in his mid 20s um and I lost my eyesight when I was 14 so I could see a pathway I could see that uh like boss losing your eyesight is not what you would say a great outcome there was still a really fulfilling life to be led so I reached out to Tony um so for me um that was really important and I mean it was a, it's a very big shock one day you're playing sport and you you sort of I was a spin bowler wasn't very good to be honest batsman I was I spent more time walking off after a duck than actually hitting the ball that's I still enjoyed playing and then suddenly I lost all my eyesight um so I watched the sunset one day and ne- next day no sunset um and the, the loss of eyesight I felt was that was just one of the things you had to live with but what shocked me and really got me motivated was the barriers society was suddenly putting in front of me so I accepted that I couldn't see a painting but i found it really confusing that when i p- wanted to get a book that was in accessible format so a book on computer that i could use my computer to translate books weren't provided to me due to copyright or when i wanted to um you know use cross the street sometimes the 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 lights didn't have beepers so i couldn't cross the street so all of these other barriers that were con- i was confronting um were things i as an, from an early age um I wanted to address so you made the, your barriers your motivation but i'm sure this must be equally shocking for your parents also so how did they deal with that and how did they deal with that phase um i honestly i don't think i really appreciated how hard it must have been for my parents until i had a son um and he's now 7 <laughs> um and not that he's um blind but i mean just the the idea of something bad happening to him how devastating that would be and so for my parents it was really devastating but then equally um they they're strong they're strong in faith and religion so they relied on that um to some extent and then we got became very devoted to helping me um achieve what I was achieving and so um and I was pretty busy pretty early on I lost my eyesight um in um what was it to the 12th of October 1990 12th of oh, sorry 12th of October 1993 and the next year a few months later I was representing my state in disability sport and so that even though it seemed really quick i mean a train accident um lost your eyesight you know so what you, you get over that physic body recovers within a few months um psychologically i suppose it could take longer but the um so the the sport straight away gave me a purpose um in a in a way it was really important because if you think about um even I mean in the Australian culture we love sport you guys love cricket for example so do we so if you're different for the wrong reason that makes you feel sad but if you're different for the right reason that makes you feel very happy so for me um being the odd the blind the blind kid at first was I was really put out as the only kid in my you know that I knew that was blind in my family my groups but then when I started being a representative sports person 
um, I was different, but also I was in the newspaper then as someone who was, you know, winning medals and things. So uh, that was really good, important for me. That's great. Uh, so my question arises from this answer only because in Indian perspective, if I compare this, if something, some accident like this happens more than our own psychology, more than our own family or society makes it difficult more. So how was the, the attitude of society towards you or your family after this accident happened? Uh, yeah, well, mixed. Mixed, to be honest. Um, some people were very positive and very supportive. So my dad worked at a, an oil company in human resource management. And they all raised um, a fair bit of money for any assistive technology I need or any supports. And so that was really, um, really nice. And some people would really um, get up and go and get them. So um, when I had a white cane, one of my teachers, my ability teachers, Grant Brannock, he was really very supportive. And he said, look, if you want to give something a shot, it might be dangerous, but give it a shot. Try going for that walk. And there are other teachers in the mobility space who would say, oh, no, 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 there's a risk. Here's a, here we'll wrap you up in cotton wool and stick you in them. You know, you can't work, you can't do anything. And so even when I was graduating from high school to study law, some people said, but you can't study law. I was like, okay, sure. Um, anyway, I, I now teach law, so, and I've practiced law, so yeah, they were wrong, but that perception was still there. And um, so sometimes you still get that. Um, even on the weekend, um, I was, um, we were, oh no, sorry, the last weekend, yeah, I was up on holidays with my wife and the air hostess spoke to her, not to me, because they didn't know how to talk to a blind person on the aircraft. Nice aircraft. And um, I mean, I'm not saying they were bad airline because I flew home from my holiday, then flew on the same, with the same company to Canberra and they're really good. It's just, that one person didn't know how to talk to a person with a disability, which was really quite stupid because um, all they had to do was talk like to anybody else. So you like to travel, sir? Um, I do. Uh, if I, um, I do like to travel, and I normally travel a lot more. Um, COVID shut me down. I was in working mm -hmm. at law school on um, a Fulbright fellowship, um, and that was you know a great honour. Um, had had an office there overlooking the Harvard Law, Law Review, um, working with Professor Michael Stone from Harvard Law School. So that was really amazing. Um, but then COVID came along and um, yeah. board had to get shut and people started dying and, well, it's time to, to get out. Um, but um, we're starting to open up, like Australia's opened up now. There's still a bit of restriction on travel. So I'll, I give a lecture in a few weeks in the Harvard Kennedy School <laughs> But I have to do that via Zoom because I can't travel. And Monday, of, I'm um, giving a lecture with the Harvard Project on Disability in Beijing. But because of COVID, I can't fly there either. So there's a lot less flying now. But that, I think that'll change soon. Uh, can you tell more about your partnership with your pet? I heard it has been an important part of your life. My, do my dog, sorry, did you say? Yeah. Um, well, my guide dog, well, for me, I lost well, my eyesight, um, as I said, at 14. So up to that point, I could just walk down the street. Now, if you're using a white cane, even you imagine a quiet street with a nice smooth pavement, well, that's not so hard to walk, but how do you know when to turn left? And how do you know when you're, you're, um, your house is? You have to, con you have to concentrate. Or, but with a guide dog, it's the closest at the moment I've ever seen to get your eyesight back. For me, um, I can let the dog walk and I can pay half attention to where I'm going. Um, he, he will find restaurants for me, um, give me dignity. So if I'm in an environment, the dog avoids me walking into things, helps me find doors. Um, so it's really, I mean, they might seem, sometimes they seem small things, but they're also a safety, it can be safety if it's a, um, a very dynamic or dangerous environment. So for me, walking around campus isn't too bad, but going around streets is a bit more dangerous. And um, when I used to work, I used to live um, and get the train into the city and then walk up um, with my white cane. And occasionally you'd have a, a tradesperson park with their the ladder out over the pavement. And if you've got a cane, if you're using a white cane, you crack your head on it. 
um, trees, branches would be cut, um, and people would, if it's busy, and a lot of most places in the world are busy, there's people everywhere, and so you, you get bumped here, you get bumped left, and you, you lose your direction and have to concentrate, sort it out, and then keep going. Whereas if I've got a guide dog, he can, we can get knocked around and totally get off track and he'll just go straight back onto where he should be going, the same way some with eyesight would. So for me, they're ex- exceptionally empowering. And also, I mean, as a small thing, which um, is pop- not really the reason to have a dog, I suppose, but it's it's helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm easily recognisable in the crowded room. If people are um, trying to remember who's Paul, well, he's the guy with the guide dog. And if you're in business or in um, any area and you want to be remembered, it's pretty easy to be remembered um, if you're the, the one with the, the only person in the room with a, a guide dog. So basically that became your identity. Yeah, it's really um, powerful. Like yesterday we were down at the Fulbright um, and everybody, I'm sure everyone remembers Sean. They probably don't, they might remember what I was saying about leadership or about um, the experiences of travel, but I'm sure they remember the dog. So basically uh, your pet uh, uh, solved half of your accessibility problems, you can say? So, um, it, saved a lot of, it helps help, helped a lot. And with um, technology on the iPhone, things like um, you know, GPS and free, free um, apps, like I use Soundscape as well, mm-hmm. which is a free one for mm-hmm. Microsoft to give it um, a, a lot of help combined with the guide dog it make, is very empowering. So, so coming to the accessibility point, uh, what were the initial challenges that you faced? Well, I, I'd say the barriers really were both technological and legal at first. So technological was we just, the internet just didn't exist. Like what is it? Um, over a billion websites now. But if you go back to the early 90s, you're talking probably thousands or maybe millions, certainly nowhere near like there is now. Or if you think about eBooks, uh, everybody, you walk down, most, you, know, you go back um, even to 20, 2,000 people carry books in their the suitcase. Now everyone carries e-readers. So e-readers are more accessible, mostly for people with print disabilities. I can't hold a stand, I can pick up a book, but I can't read it. So I used to have to scan books when I first went back to school. Or the universe, they were meant to give them to me, but um, and those were real barriers. So there was a technical, technical, technical. It's just hard for them to scan the books. Um, if, and then, the, then if even if they could, there's the legal implications around copyright. So people would be nervous yeah. sharing. And so all of those have been addressed with, or not a lot, some of them have been addressed with Marrakesh. So those sort of barriers, some, type, some situations they still exist, but we're increasingly finding ways around it. Um, so there's still a long way to go, but I think... If you have, you yeah. had to build it, now's the time to have one. Yeah. So, so from uh, 93 to this is 2022, we, the technical advancements have also come a long way. So how did technology help you in your journey? Well, um, a simple thing would be, um, I, 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 when you think about every day, you've got so much, mem- you've got so much brain power you can use. So before you just burn out, you have to have a rest. In the old days, if I was having to concentrate on where I was all the time, if I was have to, having to co- spend time, all well, that would take energy. Um, if I had to um, spend resources, time and effort to get a material I needed to use, that took effort, that's a drained energy. So I was probably losing up to an hour or two hours of, you know, cont- of effort a day. And so in, in real terms, that's mean I'm, I'm more productive than I have been in the past. Um, so if you've got files, for example, in the cloud and they're, they're uploaded in formats that are accessible, then everyone can access it. The forms are accessible are online instead of a paper-based form. It's easier for me. So I was filling out a form today instead of having to print it out get and to get someone to handwrite in or try and fill it out and sign it. It's all in, online. So that saves me a lot of – That's it's easier for everyone not having to print it out, scan it, and then, or post it back, but it's, it's even easier for me. So I would say the digital revolution has been more, more impactful for people with disabilities than the wider community. So if you think how, how, how much technology has helped the wider community, well, the, the amount it's helped people with disabilities, I would suggest two, three, four, maybe even tenfold as much. 
So, uh, so my sorry, my next question is again a hypothetical one. Mm-hmm. Suppose you are appointed as a vice chancellor of a renowned university in Australia. So, what are the immediate changes you are going to uh, enact? If I was vice chance, well, that's that's a very good question. If I was point, well, um, we're quite away from it, so it could be um, could be wrong. But let's just think. Uh, well, for the starters, I'd build in structures and I'd build governance structures that empowered all voices in the university. So you don't just want to have um, you know all white people or Indians, you know, like a cross section of your student population. So at UQ, for example, we've got a significant population of um, international students. So they have a voice in, um, so they make sure we're actually addressing their issues. And you wanna have across all levels, a representation of all diversity groups. Because I, I believe that, and I think evidence shows it, that organizations that are diverse are also innovative and more successful. So for me, I think, well, how many students come in with, a, um, say, for disability? And we have about 4% of our students ask for help and another 4% don't. So about 8% of our student population has a disability. So I think, well, what's the percentage of people with disabilities in the master's program, in the PhD program, um, at different levels throughout the academic hierarchy, um, and in, even into the chancellery, what's that percentage? And mm-hmm. if meeting those targets, we're not meeting that standard. The question should be asked, why aren't we? And what needs to be done to, um, to see whether the, um, that greater representation can be achieved? So uh, what is the one thing uh, or maybe many things you think that is important for to make the society more inclusive for people with disabilities? What more is required to be done? I think... Um, one thing I think would be helpful would be upstreaming anti-discrimination duties, which it sounds very legal, I, I know, but it would, let me explain. In, in, in um, a lot of countries, you have product safety requirements. So you can't sell a car without um, a seatbelt or a um, chainsaw without a safety switch. But a lot of times things are produced that aren't accessible but they could be made accessible, but this, the designers or the manufacturers aren't interested because there's no need, they don't see the market or this, for whatever reason. So I think we should be placing duties on those, those designers and manufacturers to make um, devices and spaces as inclusive as is reasonably possible. Not, not all, I guarantee equal um, access always because there will be situations where it's not possible um, or, um, it's just too expensive, but there's also situations where it's not. And I mean, I had one of my friends who um, directs a um, information communication company and I said, so why isn't this accessible? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, well, I asked, I asked the designers and never got a response. So he asked the question and they responded because obviously he's um, at a position of, in the hierarchy. And then they just said, there wasn't a good reason. They just hadn't thought about it. And so then they, they fixed that issue because now, now that particular company says they should be looking at this as a topic. I'm um, sorry, because mm-hmm. in their checklist, and because you know the senior per- director says um, it should be in the it needs to be considered. Everybody in the organisation complies with that because um, they like keeping their jobs. Yeah. So just that's that's one thing. So what you uh, according to you? What do you think uh, accessibility? or the lack of employment opportunities, which is the bigger hurdle in making uh, things inclusive? Um, I think employment is, uh, for me, in, in Australia, I think it's a, a, a big problem. And I think if you don't have employment, you're not economically active yeah. and you can't access um, health services the same, um, all these other housing. Like in, in, in Australia, we have... Um, well, we used to have one of the best health systems in the world, you know, public health. But still, if you go, if you have money, you get you get quicker service, you get better service. And for people with disabilities, we need, um, well, not me particularly because mine's blind, but some people need a lot more treatment. Well, if you have money, you can get, you can pay for more treatment. You can get better services. And then as you can get better treatment, you can get um, your life improves and you can work more. 
Um, also, if something goes wrong, um, if I was discriminated against, I mean, I'm a lawyer, but um, I, I can hire someone to help me advocate for me. So having economic engagement is really important. Um, and then, of course, if you actually get two positions of um, authority within organisations, then the people that are designing, the people that are running, um, start to think about um, diversity. So, I mean, at a university, for example, my the students I teach. So, if I, um, you know, I don't know how many, maybe I taught ten thousand students. I don't. I've never actually added it up. But so, say to say ten thousand students. So, ten thousand students have seen their their the person teaching them the content is a blind person. So when they go out into the workforce and an applicant comes in who's blind, they'll go, ah, I remember Paul. I don't know how he did it, but he knew more than I did. He, he, wasn't, he, he did a good job, so he did a good job. So this person, you know, they could do a good job. So that they're more, in, they're more open to including other people with disabilities. Um, and I have had calls from, you know, former students going, you know, um, you know, what do you think about this situation? And so I can um, help advocate there for people to get into work. So, so talking about financial uh, independence, uh, you think it is important for a person with disabilities, it is more important for a person with disabilities to be self-employed or be an entrepreneur, to start their, uh, their own businesses rather than having placed at some place, some other companies. How do you compare... Yeah. Uh, well, that's a really, that's a really good, that's a really interesting point you raised there because historically the International Labour Organization, they were all opposed to self-employment. So in, there was like, they were like, they all wanted everyone to be working and collectivized in, in unions. But the, the Article 27 of the Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities requires states to help people with disabilities get employment as in the traditional um, labor model, but also a work model, sorry, work model, but also self-employment and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, the entrepreneurs. And that's because people with disabilities for so long were so excluded from the, the mainstream employment market that self-employment is and is, has become a very powerful option. And if you can control the, how the companies decide, how the companies run and everything around your space, and you have a disability, you're going to make sure that the place you're working at is as inclusive as possible. So self-employment is really important for a lot of people with disabilities. In uh, India, you want to come here, travel, to work here, to make any collaboration or anything you are uh, thinking of? Um, I'd love to come to India. Um, at the moment, I'm... When, any when plans I'm, for now? Um, honestly, I, I, I've given up making plans because of COVID. Um, I have um, a, a hope that later in this year I'll be able to travel again internationally. Um, it, but at the moment, um, probably for the next, at least the next till July, I'd say I won't be travelling internationally. After that, um, our you know University of Queensland's got a really strong collaboration with a number of Indian universities, and um, so I'd, I'd love to travel over to India. We, but we have really common, our, our legal systems are very similar, both based upon, you know, the Westminster system. And so we have a lot of common ties. I just have to work it in yeah. around time when uh, there's a test match on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so match is the one point where we just come head to head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we're not going to, we're going to disagree on um, <laughs> during the test match, but we can still have um, a few beers after to celebrate the Australian winning. <laughs> After having yep. this long journey, this 20, from 93 to 2022, now when you have gone through a, a lot of things and you have experienced a lot of things. So now if I ask you, what is that one thing you want to tell 14-year-old Paul? Tell 14-year-old Paul. Um, I think it's, um, well, when you first... Um, I just, I, I don't think, I, I don't think 14 year old Paul would believe how good it gets. And I don't know how I could tell 14 year old Paul. Um, I grew up in a working class suburb. So the idea of becoming a law professor was something I couldn't have imagined possible living where I live. I couldn't imagine it. 
um, doing the things I've done, speaking at the International Labour Organization, working at Harvard Law School, being a Fulbright fellow. All of these things are just things, I've, I've even been a Paralympian, dual Paralympian, um, all these things I couldn't have imagined that I, I could have achieved. So um, I just, um, and this, like, so for that 14 year old Paul, it'd be hard to say, to imagine this, the steps between where I was and where, I, where I've got to. But no matter what you, how bad it looks, things there, there is actually so many opportunities out there. And with the, with the um, internet and um, technology advancing, I think there's so many more opportunities. So even, and I think Zoom, the, the COVID's really shown us that um, how we connect, we connect, we can be in our houses locked down and yet still communicate with those uh, across our city and across the world. So I think that means we're a more global community. So hopefully that means we can be a more inclusive community. Uh, so I heard, I heard in an interview, you said you don't need a, a site to have a vision. So right now, what kind of visions do you have for any future plans? Well, let me tell you, I think <laughs> society creates barriers and we can create solutions. And we're developing better solutions now to help in build, build into organisations ways that can en enable all people to reach their potential. So think about a business and some people, like I'm good at, say, um, activity A, but not so good at B. And one of my colleagues is really good at activity B, but not so good at activity A. Well, if I can have the activities I'm good at and I excel, excel at and they do the activities they excel at, then the overall outcome is everyone's excelling. Now, sometimes that's caused by disability and other times it's not. But I, I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that we are on um, the, the new disability politics created by this Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities has created a tipping point in society and we're moving to become more inclusive and everybody's seeking up ways to implement measures. Well, not everyone, but a, a significant amount of people are looking for how to implement measures. And if you think about an organisation, people often bag big companies and say, oh, they're, they're after money. Well, that's true. But within those organisations, if you actually look, there's often a director with um, a child with a disability or someone has a disability themselves or has had an accident or have a connection with people with disabilities making up 15 to 20% of the population. Most of the pop is like a, a major part of the population has some connection to someone with a disability and would like to do something good for the, that, that community if they're showing the way. So I think taking that opportunity to show people the way and um, I think we're going to see more and more people following and that's been my experience in the recent past. Is there any provision that if any person with this person with disability from India want to study in Australia, is there any provision for that in any of the so you're asking whether there's provisions for students with disabilities in Australia. Um, if you're an international student, um, yes, there, there are. There, and a student who comes to Australia, um, it, once you're once you're a student, um, everyone's a student. So every student has support, regardless whether they have a disability or not. Um, or not. So there's international student supports, but also. Our student services provide support. So I've had um, students with a disability who've come from overseas, wheelchairs, um, vision, low vision, there's a range of them. And they, 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 we have a central group that provides support. There's also support from the faculty. Um, so there's a lot of supports um, available. Um, it's just the, the biggest thing is contact and advance and get things structured so when you land, in um, or this goes for any student, if you've had particularly with a disability, if you contact the earlier you contact the disability supports and line everything up, the better the, the better the supports will, will be when you need them on day one. Thank you for joining us, and I think these thirty minutes are the one of the few most inspiring moments of my life. So I oh, look really to the, look forward to oh, the thank you. you come when you travel to India and we get to meet in person. So thank you for joining. Us.